If you were to make a list of decisive weapons of the war in Ukraine so far, long-range fires like artillery and missile systems would probably be near the top of that list. At a tactical level, cannon and rocket artillery has been the primary driver of casualties in the war so far. While at the operational and strategic level, long-range missile strikes seem to have played a major role in shaping the ebb and flow of battle. And so it's perhaps unsurprising that when Western military support for Ukraine considerably accelerated after February in 2022, some of the first Western-made heavy weapons to go were comparatively accurate howitzers and missile artillery systems. These systems proved significant, but things got more complicated when the Ukrainians started asking for longer-ranged ground-based fires. Through most of 2022, all they could ask for was a 30-year-old American missile system, the ATACMS. It's a system the US has refused to supply so far, stating a number of potential reasons, including fear of potential escalation and also concerns over US inventory levels. Meaning Ukraine's first long-range strike weapon received from the West wasn't a ground-based missile it could have easily integrated into its existing HIMARS systems, but instead Storm Shadow air-launched cruise missiles fired from Soviet-era aircraft. The debate over ATACMS is ultimately a political one, but it also highlighted the issue that having decided not to supply ATACMS, the US didn't really have any other ground-based options to offer with a range past 80 kilometers. After decades of relying on aviation to deliver pain at long range, the US Army arguably just didn't have that many relevant options in its toolkit. It was an issue that had been identified as far back as 2016, when General Mark Milley, who has subsequently served as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the US, said, and I quote, We don't like it, we don't want it, but yes, technically, we are outranged, outgunned on the ground. End quote. In Western media, the United States is often depicted as being without peer, the absolute top of the field when it comes to all aspects of military capability. The technical reality now is that while no other country has a force equivalent to the USAF, many now have access to ground-based artillery and missile systems that considerably outrange any potential equivalent in US Army inventory. But of course, this is the United States we're talking about. And the US Army isn't exactly comfortable with the idea of running second to anyone in anything. And thus, after decades of development missteps that we'll talk about today, the US Army is now pushing ahead with a new range of long-range precision fire options, capable of taking out valuable targets at a distance, whether the distance in question be a few dozen kilometers or far enough to speed run a couple of time zones. All right, so what am I gonna be talking about today? So first, as usual, I'm gonna give a little bit of history. That means talking about the way the historical role of long-range ground-based fires like long-range artillery and rocket systems has evolved, up to and including how useful they have been in the war in Ukraine since 2022. And then I'm going to ask three critical questions. How did the US Army fall behind in this area? Does that even matter? And how is it now trying to catch up? Because it's a plan that involves everything from big guns to really, really big guns to hypersonic missiles. We'll ask what that might mean for force design and the relationship between the services. What might weapons like this mean for the near-peer battlefield of the future? And what sort of countermeasures might militaries around the world need to be investing in to protect themselves from a new generation of precision weapons on a fully networked and very transparent battlefield? But before we jump into those questions, let me first welcome back a long-term and returning sponsor, Ground News. Comparing multiple sources is almost essential if you're going to avoid echo chambers in media reporting. Ground News is a combination website and app that helps you do exactly that, collecting thousands of articles and news stories every day and organizing them in a way that makes them easy to compare. Looking at this story covering US aid to Ukraine, for example, Ground News lets you compare the headlines and even read the articles from each outlet without leaving the app, which can save me and you a great deal of time and effort. You can also hunt for stories that might be underreported by the left or right. This story on South Korean aid to Ukraine only had one left-leaning source reporting on it, whereas this story on the Pope had a shortage of right-leaning sources. And what's even better is you can actually filter coverage for stories that are coming out of a specific area like Ukraine. So if you're looking for focused coverage, Ground News' new map feature is a great way to do it. In short, when you have a finite amount of time to compare and contrast news, Ground News can give you a more effective and efficient means to do so. So I'd encourage you to give it a try by clicking on the link in the description, which will offer you a 30% discount on their Vantage subscription. Okay, so before we start looking at the next generation of ground-based fires, it's probably worth looking at how they've evolved through history and the role they now play. Through most of human history, artillery is operating primarily against frontline targets. Whether you're talking about a Roman legion or a battle during the American Civil War, if artillery is being deployed during a land battle, the target was probably the opposing army and also probably within line of sight. 
that wasn't just a result of limitations with the weapons themselves. A World War II M1 howitzer could comfortably outrange a modern M777. And during World War I, the Germans built the Paris gun capable of shelling a city-sized target from 120 kilometers away. Instead, the key problem to delivering accurate fire, with accurate being the word with the asterisk there, were largely limitations on how effectively armies could find targets, call in fire on them, and then correct that fire. And that's because when your primary mechanism for calling in fire is the use of a human forward observer who is likely on the ground, maybe with some mechanical assistance, there is only so far, depending on the terrain, that poor sod can see. And wherever a forward observer could see, the artillery could probably reach. It's perhaps one of the reasons famous American general William Depew said of his battalion's role during World War II that in essence his main accomplishment had been to move the forward artillery observers across France and Germany, implying that so far as doing actual damage to German forces was concerned, it wasn't the infantrymen and their rifles doing the work, it was the artillery. Depew would later go on to describe infantry as being like a sensor, a sensory organisation that worked itself into the fabric of the terrain and which could then call in firepower, including artillery and airstrikes, to really go about the job of inflicting casualties on the opposing force. American infantry may have had high-quality small arms, like the M1 Garand, but you could argue the most dangerous infantryman in a group was always going to be the one with the radio, because it was he, ultimately, who could summon the wrath of the big guns. But as deadly as it was, this observer-based model was always going to suffer from a basic drawback. With the weapons in the rear and the forward observer limited to the front lines, there was only so far the artillery was going to be able to reliably strike. One potential solution to that problem was to use aircraft instead. A pilot or observer in the air is going to be able to see further, or else being equal than someone on the ground. And that advantage can be leveraged either to call in fire from Army Cooperation aircraft, or through the novel solution of simply adding weapons to the aircraft and enabling them to make the attacks themselves. Aircraft could carry heavier payloads than most artillery shells had considerable range and reach, and the ability to some extent to hunt their own targets. And so during the Second World War, you see entire fleets of tactical aircraft not just being used for close air support right at the front line, but also for operations deep into the enemy's operational depth, for example, shooting up train lines to inhibit supplies, or bombing convoys of trucks trying to move fuel and equipment to the front line. The use of attack aircraft would continue to evolve through the Cold War and beyond. In an era before advanced ISR technologies or precision guidance capabilities, this was the precision weapon system of the day, albeit with the guidance system being the brain of the pilot or the bombardier. Of course, that doesn't mean that armies around the world had given up on the idea of attacking long-range targets themselves. Trying to achieve range by simply building a bigger gun wasn't a practical solution. Massive German railway guns, for example, might be able to reach out 50 kilometers with a very heavy shell. But they had crews measured in hundreds, rates of fire measured in rounds per day, and saying that systems like the Paris gun were accurate enough to hit targets like Paris isn't exactly a top-shelf accuracy claim. And while some World War II super guns were better, these things were very much sledgehammers, not sniper rifles. Not to mention the fact there was always the risk of one opposing ground attack pilot seeing this thing and deciding that he really, really wanted to be able to paint a super gun kill marker on the nose of his aircraft. Now, during the Cold War, armies around the world found a solution, if you can call it that, to the range and precision problem. Rockets could pack a lot of payload and range into a relatively small package. And then as for the problems of target identification or precision, well, that was okay, you just added a nuclear warhead to the rocket. Because missing by one or two hundred meters doesn't matter too much when your intention is to level everything in the postcode. And so we saw a number of guided and unguided Cold War rocket systems intended to hit tactical and operational targets with nuclear warheads. Two examples that come to mind immediately are the French Pluton and the Soviet 9K-52, aka the Frog 7. But for those of you worried that armies at the time may have been engaging in horrendous overkill, don't worry, the commanders of the era had access to plenty of non-nuclear options as well. Like this American cluster munition intended to deliver little bomblets filled with sarin nerve gas. And if you are of the view that perhaps a warhead containing more than 50 nerve gas submunitions probably doesn't belong on the battlefield, don't worry, the US Army did agree with you. Which is why the successor rocket, the MGM-29 Sergeant, wasn't capable of delivering 50 nerve gas submunitions anymore. Instead, it could deliver more than 300. As militaries began to move towards solutions to rear area targets that didn't involve making large areas of Germany uninhabitable with weapons of mass destruction, 
Different forces place the emphasis for their solutions in different areas. Many NATO militaries, for example, placed increasing emphasis on their air forces, while many divested themselves of their old long-range cluster munition rockets and weapons of that type. You saw the emergence of better communication networking technologies and new precision-guided munitions. But many powers that lacked an air force of the same size, scale and capability as the United States one continued to do things differently. Right up to its final days, the Soviet Union would continue to develop very heavy, long-ranged, ground-based rocketry systems, both MLRS types and tactical ballistic missiles. And the Russians would continue where the Soviet Union left off, putting a lot of emphasis on ground-based systems with considerable reach. As would others like North Korea and the People's Republic of China. And for powers that might have less need of delivering firepower around the world, and instead just from Kaliningrad to Berlin or across the Taiwan Strait, this approach made significant sense, and increasingly led to these powers having ground-based reach that well exceeded many NATO competitors. And what that extra reach means is that armies in those countries might have more flexibility in the sort of targets that they can engage with their own ground-based fire assets, as compared to a force which may only have invested in shorter-range systems. I say flexibility because there's probably no such thing as the perfect ground-based artillery or missile system. Instead, systems have to balance a variety of factors, how far they can shoot, the impact they have when they arrive, how responsive they are, how precise they are, and if you refuse to compromise on any of that and end up just giving every company its own organic cruise missile battery, then when all else fails, you're going to have to compromise on cost. Different targets require a different combination of characteristics. If Pavel and his mates call an artillery on infantry in the open, they probably need mortars, not a storm shadow strike. And insisting against all logic on trying to use the latter would make about as much sense as trying to take a passenger jet six city blocks. The key point, of course, is that not all armies possess a suite of ground-based weapon systems capable of engaging all types of targets at all relevant ranges. A military that only has access to mortars and cannon artillery, for example, might be limited to engaging tactical targets enemy troops, armour, artillery, or fighting positions. But one with access to something like a tactical ballistic missile with a range of several hundred kilometres has more options. They might be able to engage operational or even strategic targets, airfields, depots, maybe even factories. While their shorter-ranged opponents may, for better or worse, be reliant on the ability of ships or aviation to put fire on those sort of more distant targets. But those are primarily theoretical concerns. So before we jump into US programs and modernization efforts, I want to ask a little bit about what the war in Ukraine might have taught us about the role and potential of fires in a modern conventional battlefield. The two caveats as I do this are obviously, one, the war in Ukraine is probably not representative of all future conflicts. It has a lot of factors involved that may be unique to it, and so you need to be careful not to overlearn the lessons we're now observing. The second is that this section owes a lot to a couple of key sources, all of which I'll be sure to document in the description. Key observation one is the battlefield is becoming increasingly transparent. With drones being so cheap, so disposable and so frequently available, it's become harder and harder to avoid detection for any meaningful amount of time. Many of the front lines in Ukraine are absolutely saturated with drones. And while electronic warfare systems and other countermeasures destroy thousands of them per month, they're so easy to replace that they remain up there all the same. And when you combine a transparent battle space where everyone is visible with an awful lot of artillery, it makes the battlefield a really dangerous place for anyone who happens to be in the open. Staying alive in the face of that sort of lethality requires countermeasures. Rusi identified several, dispersion to the point that you're not worth engaging with artillery, moving so quickly that you can't be engaged, or entrenching so deeply that you can simply endure whatever fires are directed against you. To this, I'd add a few extra clarifying points. Firstly, dispersion often means not bringing large amounts of heavy equipment right up to the line of contact. I often read in comments, for example, why don't the Ukrainians just roll guepards up to the front line to shoot down all the drones that are hovering over their positions? The problem, of course, being that a valuable vehicle too close to the front line is going to be vulnerable to artillery. The second thing to say is that electronic warfare is playing a massive role as are, in some cases, ground-based air defences. One counter the Russians have to HIMARS is to try and shoot down the incoming rockets. 
which, all else being equal, might be another defensive option alongside dispersing or entrenching. Another way of protecting yourself is just to have a longer reach than the other guy, with this being particularly true when you're talking about the counter-battery duel between competing artillery units. If you have a cannon that can fire 40 kilometers and your opponents can only fire 24, then you're going to have a significant advantage because you can park outside of range and engage them in some degree of safety. Until, of course, they bring in some other weapon system with a longer range. Alternatively, if critical targets like ammunition dumps are being engaged by an opposing weapon, say HIMARS, simply moving those targets out of range of those systems is a relatively reliable defense. Because it doesn't matter if your opponent can find a target if they don't have a weapon capable of hitting it. I'd also raise the suggestion for discussion that even though the Ukrainian battlefield is a very transparent and dangerous place with lots of sensors, lots of long-range artillery, lots of fire being exchanged, there might be reason to believe that other future battlefields could be even more so, more dangerous at greater distances. For one, neither side has particularly deep stocks of long-range precision munitions available for tactical use. Russia doesn't produce that many Iskanders and fired a lot of them in the beginning of the war. And we haven't seen much evidence of having large stocks of, for example, guided 300mm MLRS ammo. Added to that, both sides have quite good defensive options available to them. This is a war between nations that were sitting on two of the world's largest stockpiles of surface-to-air missiles. So you've got armies with a lot of defensive options like electronic warfare and GBAD, limited offensive options and systems, and yet the battlefield is still an incredibly transparent and dangerous place for anything in the open. Which I'd argue sets up some pretty ugly prospects for any confrontation between two forces with more mature offensive capabilities and similar or perhaps even reduced focuses on defensive options. Okay, so the modern battlefield is likely to be highly networked, highly transparent, and incredibly lethal if you have sufficient long-range fires on tap. We know America probably has the ISR assets, probably has the networking capability, it definitely has the air-launched fires, but how does it go on the ground, starting specifically with their cannon artillery? Because here there's an inescapable truth of physics, which means that American cannoneers usually have less range available to them than many of their competitors and allies alike. And that is, when it comes to cannons, size matters. All else being equal, and to a hypothetical upper limit, a longer barrel is going to let you get more range and performance out of ammunition than a shorter one is. Load a rifle round into something the size of a handgun, for example, and you'll get an incredibly loud bang, horrendous recoil, and absolutely abysmal ballistic performance. And so sometimes if you want to get to those critical but difficult to reach places, sometimes there is no substitute for length. To be fair, there are a lot of good things you could say about America's existing primary self-propelled gun, the M109. But, in some critical hard factors, it falls down. Your average M109 doesn't have an autoloader, it has a much lower rate of fire than many of its competitors, and it's cursed to still have a 39 caliber gun. Caliber here being a multiplier, so the gun is about 6 meters long, 39 times 155 millimeters. With expensive precision-guided Excalibur ammunition, that means an M109 can reach out to targets about 40 kilometers away. By contrast, the most recent Russian self-propelled gun, the Koalitsia, has a longer-range 152mm cannon, capable, according to US materials, of engaging targets out to 70 kilometers with precision-guided munitions. Indeed, on paper, it seems like a much better gun almost all round, suffering only from those two common problems of many modern Russian weapon systems. Namely, that most of its performance characteristics are either only claims, or at least not demonstrated in reality, and that having developed it, the Russians seem to have struggled to produce more than a dozen or so of the things. The People's Republic of China has gone further, abandoning the old Soviet 152mm in their new guns and moving over to a 52 caliber 155mm design. Deployed both facing India and the Taiwan Strait, the PCL-181, is again reported to have a significant reach advantage over the existing M109s. And then, of course, there's the big gun of many European NATO militaries. This is the German-designed Panzerhaubitze 2000, and it combines an advanced auto-loading system with a 52 caliber gun that allows it to rapidly deliver small packages of precision-guided unity, justice, and freedom out to 70 kilometers. Part of the secret to the performance of guns like Caesar or the PZH-2000 is the combination of the longer gun, the advanced fire control system, and also some long-ranged ammunition options. This probably shouldn't be surprising, there's a lot of European DNA in a lot of Western artillery ammunition. 
The famous American M982, the Excalibur round for example, has a not insignificant amount of Swedish DNA. And the Italian Volcano series is basically the Ferrari of artillery ammunition. Just looking at the 155mm shell, there's a normal ballistic option that'll get out to 50km, a guided long-range munition capable of reaching out to 70km, the explosive filler is an expensive, insensitive munition mix, which makes it far safer than traditional TNT, plus you have a laundry list of remaining blingy features and options. Preform tungsten ring fragmentation, the ability to swap in a semi-active laser guidance system, and basically everything short of a custom gloss paint finish. Small numbers of these rounds reportedly did go to Ukraine, where they were reportedly highly valued, but they do suffer from the same drawback as many advanced European systems. Namely that, despite being ostensibly a consumable good, I'm relatively certain the most advanced version of these shells is considerably outnumbered in circulation by actual Ferraris. But that's okay, maybe a reach disadvantage is okay when it comes to cannon artillery. Because most armies, including the US one, don't rely on cannons to be their longest range ground-based fires, they use missiles. And here the US Army has access to a significant number of a now extremely famous missile system. HIMARS and M270 give a much bigger range than the M109 howitzers. Although given that these days they only fire expensive precision-guided munitions, they can't provide the sort of saturating artillery fire the cannons can. Or at least I suppose they couldn't do so for very long without causing the relevant oversight officials at the US Treasury to spontaneously combust as soon as they opened the relevant report. HIMARS and M270 give the US Army access to a guided 227mm rocket good to about 80km, the famous Gimlers. And then there's still a supply of the older ATACMS missile with its 300km range. Eventually these may be joined by some 150km options, the ground launch small diameter bomb that we've talked about before, and an extended range version of the Gimlers, the Gimlers ER. But for the moment, that's most of what there is. Now to be fair, this is a significant capability and Ukraine has been asking for ATACMs for some time. But before you go chanting USA, USA, consider for a moment what else is out there. The People's Republic of China, for example, has spent decades building up multiple families of ground-launched rockets. These range from tactical MLRS systems intended for battlefield support, all the way out to anti-shipping ballistic missiles with the potential to threaten US carrier groups well offshore. But to illustrate the point, I'll focus on just one recent system. One that wasn't even in service when General Milley made his comments about US ground forces being outranged. This is the PHL-16 multiple launch rocket system, having entered in service only within the last five years. PHL-16 is a considerably newer system than HIMARS and M270, while also possessing considerably greater punch and reach. It achieves both those feats through the complicated engineering approach known as making the system bigger. Whereas a HIMARS rocket pod will carry six 227mm rockets, PHL-16 can mount eight 370mm munitions. That means that even without swapping out to the Fire Dragon, the Chinese equivalent of ATACMs, this particularly subtle piece of fire support equipment can deliver fires out to 280 kilometers. And on the fronts where we have seen this system visually confirmed to have been deployed, so facing India on the disputed border between the PRC and India, and also facing the Taiwan Strait, you can imagine the significant value that sort of reach might bring the Chinese. For example, were for some unknown reason a member of the People's Liberation Army, Navy, Marine Corps were to find themselves on a beach on the island of Taiwan, they would be capable of calling in fires from PHL-16 systems that were still based in mainland China. Meanwhile, if Ukraine ever had access to the system, a launcher based in Kherson would be able to hit targets across the vast majority of Crimea. It means that even in an environment where the PLA might not have air superiority, ground forces may still have significant long-range fires at their disposal. But despite being one of the largest regular systems out there, I think we can agree that 370mm rockets, it's still vaguely reasonable. So let's look at unreasonable. Because, as I've said before, there are a couple of ways to build a rocket that goes further, all else being equal. You can improve the aerodynamics and the efficiency of the design, you can change the repellent you're using, you can get an improved motor, or you can apply the Kerbal Space Program approach of simply adding more boosters and making the things bigger until you get the range that you want, 
at the expense of firing a measurable percentage of your GDP at the opponent every time you pull the trigger. Thus is the approach with the North Korean KN-25, because having been tested in 2019, this is a 600mm MLRS system. This thing is so big that it blurs the line between an MLRS system and a tactical ballistic missile. And the reporting available suggests that it's been tested out to 380 kilometers. Now, no, it is not likely to be particularly accurate, and yes, it is likely to be built to the finest North Korean engineering standards, meaning at least two quality levels short of what my agent grandpa could probably manage in his workshop. But at 380 kilometers, you can hit just about all of the Republic of Korea's territory from North Korean territory. And even though the technology involved probably isn't up to the standards of Raytheon's finest, a 600mm payload is probably going to deliver a significant amount of hurt to everything in the vicinity of the landing area. And if the only thing you had available to respond with was a TACMS, then your only available retaliation option would be very accurately and precisely destroying targets 80 kilometers short of the enemy launch site. So you could argue that General Milley had a point about the US Army in 2016 in relation to the Russians, and the statement would be even more true now when applied to certain other potential competitors. The US Army does have plenty of options available to deal with targets at very long ranges, but only if it's willing to call in support from one of the other services. All right, so maybe there are some tools out there that US allies and potential competitors have access to that the US Army doesn't. Given the truly massive scale of the American military budget and the relatively advanced technological base it operates from, you might be wondering how on earth that happened. But keep in mind, even though that seems like a simple question, it doesn't guarantee there'll be a simple answer. One normal answer you'll often see, for example, is that the US Army just hasn't cared that much about ground-based long-range fires. And to be fair, there's certainly an element of truth to this. The US has enjoyed an advantage in the air for decades at this point, so it could afford to skimp on ground-based options. You don't need to invest super heavily in massively oversized MLRS systems and rockets if the US Air Force is always going to be there to bomb your opponent into smithereens. Then the US Army goes on to fight two decades of largely counterinsurgency war fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is an environment of absolute air supremacy where drones, helicopters, and aircraft are going to be able to roam at will and where the adversary is deeply limited in terms of range and heavy weapons. You don't need an expensive tactical ballistic missile to deal with an insurgent mortar position. An M777 howitzer or some close air support is going to be able to deal with that threat just fine. So in essence, if you're fighting a counterinsurgency, it makes sense to pour your resources into countering IEDs and ambushes, as opposed to resurrecting the old ATACM's production line. And to an extent, this is probably part of the answer but also probably far from all of it. Because the US used to have a significant number of long-ranged ground-launched missiles, albeit ones primarily designed for the nuclear mission. The US Army operated medium-range ballistic missiles, the Pershing-2, and the vehicle you're looking at here is the Griffin, a four-tube launcher for ground-launched Tomahawk cruise missiles operated by the United States Air Force. Now the Tomahawk is also used for the conventional strike mission. There's no reason you couldn't just put a conventional warhead on it and say, hey presto, we have a ground-launched long-range weapon. But by 1991, all American ground-launched cruise missiles had been retired because the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty between the US and the Soviet Union prohibited all nuclear-capable ballistic and ground-launched cruise missiles with ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. In terms of increasing strategic stability and decreasing the odds of nuclear war, that was a fantastic development. Short-range nuclear weapons tend to have very low warning times and make people nervous. But it also meant for several decades the US military simply wasn't able to develop any ground-based fires with a range beyond 500 kilometers. Now, of course, that should also have prevented the Russians from doing so, but they found an interesting loophole in the treaty. Namely that if you simply ignore the agreement, design and field the weapons anyway, and then just allegedly lie about their range, then amazingly the piece of paper itself has no magical ability to stop you. The US would spend several years from 2014 to 2018 constantly alleging Russian breaches of the INF before both sides finally withdrew in 2019. It's only at that point that it became legal again for the US to field ground-based fires in that range bracket. 
which does, to be fair, probably go some way towards explaining why no such systems exist. But why, you might ask, has the US not at least attempted to develop a better cannon artillery system or a better rocket artillery system? After all, those are battlefield systems that fall well outside the restrictions of the INF. And the unfortunate answer is, they tried. The XM-2001 Crusader was originally going to be America's next generation self-propelled howitzer. Beginning development in the 1990s, this system was originally meant to enter service in, I think, 2008. For the time, and on paper, this was going to be a heck of a vehicle. The old manually loaded 39 caliber gun was out, and in was a longer auto-loading 155. It had the same 1500 horsepower gas turbine engine as the M1 Abrams battle tank, meaning it could really get up and go. And then there were a wide array of advanced features, including a cooling system for the gun, and a complex computer system that was reportedly partly responsible for the program's delay. Such was the nature of the project that back in 1999, Colonel Charles Cartwright, who at the time was a program manager for the program, said, quote, Some folks at the Pentagon have claimed we're just as sophisticated as the F-22. End quote. Now, it's hard to tell from context, but my plain reading suggests the colonel meant that in a good way. But America, pure opinion and real talk here for a moment. If your big gun on tracks is as complicated as a super cruising stealth fighter, then someone somewhere may have gone just a little bit overboard. It's kind of like a brand saying my new fridge is going to have more processing power than an old gaming console. I suspect they're trying to impress me, but my actual response is just going to be why. I need my fridge to be able to keep food cold, not to run Minecraft. At the time, the Government Accountability Office in the US did raise some question marks about the program. They suggested Army should reconsider it, or potentially consider buying a European system like the German PZH-2000. But Army would ultimately push on with its Space Age howitzer until the $11 billion program was cancelled in 2002. And if you happen to be an American taxpayer feeling physical pain being told how much money was spent to not field a new howitzer, well, I'm sorry because we're just getting started. Because one of the many reasons the program was cancelled was that Army was already developing another new generation howitzer this time as part of a much larger transformation program called Future Combat Systems. FCS was meant to be the Army's most ambitious, far-reaching modernization program since World War II. The budget was massive, and it involved looking at technologies that ranged from heads-up displays in soldier helmets to an entirely new family of manned ground combat vehicles intended to replace everything from the M1 Abrams to the M109. All of those vehicles were meant to be built onto basically the same chassis, making this arguably the American equivalent of the Armata program. And because the idea of the time was for high-speed, low-drag, rapid deployability overseas, even the main battle tank-type vehicle was meant to only weigh about 18 tonnes, with the idea being that a really good active protection system was a fantastic alternative for heavy armour plating. The self-propelled gun part of this family actually reached the prototype stage. This was the NLOC, the non-line-of-sight cannon. And it was a very different vehicle to the Crusader. It had a two-person crew and a much lower combat weight. The vehicle would eventually be cancelled, along with the entire FCS range of vehicles. And with billions more spent and no in-service vehicle to show for it, the army ultimately fell back on one of the alternatives to the original Crusader proposal with the Army finally turning its attention to modernising the M109 to the A7 variant, with a reminder here that the very first M109s served in Vietnam. Now, I understand when people say I spend a lot of time focusing on Russian procurement and development failures, but make no mistake, they have no monopoly on the concept. They're just the ones who happen to be fighting a war right now and paying the price for it. But when I eventually do do a video on how procurement destroys armies, you can expect more than a few Western examples in there. And on that distinguished and storied list, the US's quarter-century effort to not successfully field a new self-propelled howitzer may not get a feature, but it certainly gets an honourable mention. While there are probably plenty of more reasons we could unpack to explain why the US got into this position, perhaps the more pertinent point is having fallen behind, the US Army now seems very intent on catching up. And here's the thing. When jolted with a sense of urgency, the US military doesn't tend to respond with small tweaks around the edges. Instead, it tends to deploy its massive resources to outmatch its opponents at scale. 
meaning that presumably when the designers and contractors ask the US Army what sort of systems and ranges it wants in its new generation long-range fire capabilities, the response seems to have been yes. Because while it may have been acceptable to US forces not to really modernise ground-based fires in the early 21st century, by 2018 or so, things are starting to change. The 2018 National Defence Strategy explicitly identified a need for more long-range strike platforms, including long-range ground-based fires. The old push for a lighter, sleeker, counterinsurgency, internationally deployable force was partly gone, and heavy metal and firepower was back in. The 2018 NDS said that Army needed more armour, long-range fires, engineering and air defence units to meet the need of ground-heavy challenges posed by Russia and Eastern Europe while maintaining a robust deterrent to aggression on the Korean Peninsula. And as you can imagine, if you're trying to provide a ground-based deterrent against two of the most artillery-heavy armies in the world, then you probably need more fires and fewer MRAPs. The Army followed up with an operational concept called Multi-Domain Operations, MDO. And there was a call on the Joint Force to have the capability to penetrate into territory that might be in range of an opponent's anti-access area denial weapons, like long-range missiles. Given that many insurgent movements seem to conspicuously lack long-range anti-shipping missiles, this was another clue that Army might be getting back into the business of great power competition. The 2018 publication, The US Army in Multi-Domain Operations 2028, did set out some potential threats. With, for some reason, the US Army choosing to focus on competition from Russia and China, rather than the still enduring danger of a sudden British campaign to attempt to reclaim the colonies. The wider LRPF program includes multiple components. Taken together, these are meant to give US Army new capabilities whether you're talking about engaging targets at 70 kilometers or 700. As a result, it includes systems ranging from a new generation self-propelled howitzer, the Extended Range Cannon Artillery System, or ERCA, all the way out to a hypersonic glide vehicle called the Long Range Hypersonic Weapon. And what I'd like to do now is have a look at each of these programs in turn. And we're going to start, of course, with another attempt to develop and field a next-generation self-propelled howitzer. And this vehicle here is at the core of the attempt, the M1299. And while it's still very much a prototype early-stage development vehicle, it's got some hallmark American features, like the tendency to go big or go home. You'll recall the US is currently outgunned by allies and competitors who use 52 caliber 155mm guns instead of the US 39 caliber. So instead of simply matching everyone else, the US has decided to go bigger with a 58 caliber gun. So you're talking about roughly 9 meters of barrel and a very significant chamber capacity for propellant. Taken together, that means that in testing, this thing was able to hit a target at 70 kilometers using a rocket-assisted projectile, which reportedly is more than twice as far as an M777 howitzer will throw that same round. In December of last year, the system went even further this time firing a specialised XM-1155 projectile 110 kilometres. Now, XM-1155 is a specialised guided projectile designed and produced by BAE Systems. And what those range figures mean is that this is a cannon artillery system capable of delivering precision fire further than the Gimler's rockets of HIMARS. And XM-1155 is neither the only extended range munition out there, nor are shells like this likely to be exclusive to the ERCA. You're probably always going to get more performance out of a larger and more modern cannon, all else being equal. But this joint Norwegian Boeing program to develop ramjet-powered projectiles is meant to be compatible with just about any NATO 155mm gun. So loading something like this into a PZH-2000 or a Caesar isn't going to give you the same range results, but it's still going to give you range results the existing Ukrainian artillery, for example, could only dream of. The important thing to say, however, is that there's always going to be trade-offs in designing rounds like this one. When you start adding things like ramjet motors and guidance systems to artillery shells, you're both adding cost and usually removing warhead weight. So it's incredibly unlikely that artillery crews are going to roll into battle with an ammunition rack full of nothing but this sort of extreme range ammunition. Instead, think of it more like expensive tungsten core armor-piercing ammunition from the Second World War, sometimes issued in small numbers to tank crews or anti-tank gunners, not to fire at anything that moved, but rather for the special occasions that called for the fancy ammo. Kind of like keeping one or two higher-priced bottles of wine around the house, so that if any particularly fancy members of your friends or family group ever happen to visit, 
you can just plonk those down on the table and pretend that, that is absolutely what you drink all the time. A specialised answer to a rare but significant problem. But we're only talking 100, 150 kilometres here. This is America. And in America, having a gun which is only slightly bigger than everyone else's just won't do. And what if instead of being able to fire a shell from one end of Los Angeles to the other, I instead wanted to be able to shell Ottawa or Montreal from Central Park in New York? Well, then you'd be talking about one of those historical supergun concepts now, wouldn't you? The ones I marked as being overcomplicated, expensive, vulnerable, and generally not worth the effort that it took to develop them. Well, in any case, on a completely unrelated note, it was reported back in 2021 that the US Army is reportedly examining the feasibility of developing a cannon that can fire a projectile at hypersonic speeds up to 1,000 miles. In the 2021 CRS report and a number of other documents, this is referred to as the Strategic Long Range Cannon, or SLRC ostensibly to consist of a cannon, a prime mover to move that cannon, a trailer and projectiles capable of delivering massed fires at strategic ranges. Now, if all I've told you is those figures, you're probably with me so far. But if the next thing I told you was that these guns were meant to operate in batteries of four, each with a crew of eight soldiers, I imagine some of you might be suddenly very confused. Because if you're imagining a gun which can shell Moscow from London, you're probably not imagining something that can be crewed by eight blokes in a dream. You may instead be imagining some sort of skyscraper-sized mega project, an uber cannon quite unlike anything the world has ever seen before. But you would be very, very wrong. Because some of the only art that I was able to find on the internet from Army Futures Command seems to legitimately depict this thing as just a large artillery piece that can be dragged around by a prime mover. With the stated goal of penetrating and disintegrating enemy anti-access and area denial defences to create windows of opportunity for exploitation by the joint force. So basically, a relatively reasonably sized artillery piece with a relatively small crew, capable of flinging hypersonic shells at other countries to destroy things like their air defence systems, so the rest of the US armed forces can go to work. Now, okay, that sounds at least a little bit interesting as a project. And so the US put money into studying the concept and determining whether or not with all of the technology and know-how available to the US military industrial complex, could something like this practically be built and fielded? And the answer, of course, must have been no, because the project was cancelled in 2022. An unclassified version of the report assessing the feasibility of the SLRC was also released. As a professional and unclassified report, it's very diplomatic in its language, but it basically suggested that if Army was serious about this idea, then it needed to go back to the drawing board and do some hard thinking. That it needed to be sure exactly how it would use this gun, how many guns it would need, and whether this really was the most cost-effective way of achieving those goals. After all, there were some estimates that the first thousand rounds for this thing were going to cost $8 million each. What I'll add just as personal opinion for consideration is that while there probably is a great future for concepts like railguns, for example, at current technology levels, militaries could probably do worse than avoiding any development project that tries to make guns do distinctly missile things. Not because it's necessarily impossible to do it, but rather because it's kind of like trying to use rockets to do passenger jet things. If you pay the relevant engineers enough, they will find you a workable solution. It'll probably just be a far less efficient one than what we already had. So for a more reasonable solution to the long-range problem, the US Army is probably going to have to turn to missiles rather than super cannons. And fortunately for them, there are quite a few missile programs under the umbrella of the long-range precision fires priority. The first system in this category is the Precision Strike Missile, or PRISM. PRISM is intended to replace and improve upon the old ATACM system, something which is badly needed considering the old ATACMs are no longer in production. In its initial increment 1 version, it's designed to be able to reach out to a range of about 500 kilometers to enable engagement of critical time-sensitive targets like air defenses, missile launchers, command and control centers, and high payoff targets. Later on, the Army intends to add the capacity to engage maritime or moving targets as well. And all this in a package that doesn't just fly further, but also one that's considerably more compact. Whereas a HIMARS pod could carry one ATACMS at a time, it'll be able to carry two PRISMs. 
albeit with some trade-offs in the form of Prism both carrying a smaller warhead than ATACMs and costing considerably more for the same amount of destructive potential. So in essence, this is going to be the Gen Alpha version of the old millennial ATACMs. Sleeker, more technologically advanced, and badly inflation impacted. As it stands, budget documents suggest US Army is looking to purchase about 110 Prisms in fiscal year 2024, with the goal of increasing that procurement rate to 200 per annum, and eventually procuring a very specific 3,986 Prism Increment 1s. And as they arrive, they should begin first augmenting and then fully replacing a Tacoms in inventory. With a range of about 500 kilometers, Prism will give the Americans a direct answer to systems like the Russian Iskander M. But now that the US is no longer bound by the INF Treaty, it seems like US Army has no intention of stopping there. Which brings us to the so-called mid-range capability, or MRC. And the idea here is to give Army long-range fire battalions something that can reach targets in that range bracket between 500 kilometers out to perhaps 1500. And instead of reinventing the wheel at the cost of an exceptional number of taxpayer dollars, the solution it seems Army has come up with is something called the Typhon Launcher, which is basically what happens when you take a Mark 41 naval vertical launch system from the Navy's warships and stick it on the back of a truck. In a sense, this gives the Army something similar to the old Air Force Griffin Tomahawk launchers of the late Cold War. A ground-based mechanism to launch multiple either Tomahawk cruise missiles, or modified versions of the SM-6. So suddenly our ground-based fires options have gone from a maximum range of perhaps 300 kilometers with ATACMs to 1500 kilometers using Tomahawk. And for those who have been desperately trying to follow along despite being primarily familiar with freedom units, 1500 kilometers is about 930 miles. Which probably leaves you asking a question. If the MRC is literally about yeeting cruise missiles 930 miles towards various targets, why on earth is this thing called a mid-range capability? And were the people involved in naming the project simply having a laugh? The answer, it turns out, is no, they weren't. Because the army is also intending to introduce a system which fires even further. This is the incredibly creatively named Long Range Hypersonic Weapons Program which is intended to deliver Army a hypersonic weapon capable of engaging targets at long ranges. This thing is the ground-based application of the common hypersonic glide body that we discussed in my video on hypersonics, meaning the intention here is to have a ground-based launcher for a hypersonic delivery system that is both capable of maneuvering during its flight and also reaching out to targets 2,800 kilometers from the launching location. Or to put that kind of distance into perspective, more than far enough to fly from Tokyo to Beijing. Each army battery equipped with the LRHW reportedly will have four transporter erector launcher TELs, each armed with two missiles. That would give every battery commander of one of these units the ability to destroy eight independent, highly valuable, time-sensitive targets at international distances. Plus, at the most recent cost estimates, I was able to find of approximately $40 million per missile. Each battery commander would also have the capacity to fire missiles equivalent to the annual GDP of the nation of Tonga without reloading. Because for all the advantages of hypersonic weapon systems, cost isn't one of them. Taken together, all the long-range precision fires programs give the army a variety of options. Expressed here in this classic document, the long-range precision fires football chart, courtesy of the US Army. It shows that when compared to equivalent Russian systems, the US will go from being at a range disadvantage to parity or even advantage. But as interesting as this chart is, it undersells the ambition of what the US Army is trying to do. And it does it by having an x-axis that isn't linear. The distance between 30 and 40 kilometers on that chart towards the left is wider than the distance between 1600 and 2250 kilometers towards the right. Now, I'm not saying there's anything deceptive going on here. Obviously, it just makes the chart easier for a person to read. But it does somewhat conceal the scale of what we're talking about. And it's why I'd always recommend if someone shows you a bit of data that looks unusual, one of the first things you should always do is check to see if they've done anything funny with the X or Y axis. So let's take the ranges of the Long Range Precision Fire's weapon systems and put them into a chart with a consistent distance scale. 
And there you go. In terms of gun systems, the range extends from 40 kilometers with an existing rocket-assisted projectile fired from an M109A7 out to about 120 kilometers using the ERCA and some ramjet-assisted artillery ammo. But the truly transformative change is in the missile systems from a current maximum range of about 300 kilometers using ATACMS to 2,800 using the long-range hypersonic weapon. That is a truly transformative increase in range. Because now, for example, if an army infantry unit was to find itself being attacked by Iskander missiles being fired from 400 kilometers away, now instead of just hunkering down and waiting for the Air Force to make the problem go away, army would hypothetically have a weapon capable of putting fire onto that missile system then probably also onto the headquarters of that missile system, the logistical centre that transported that missile system. And if they were feeling particularly vindictive, possibly even sling some hypersonic warheads into the factory that produced the damn things two and a half thousand kilometres away. These are no longer purely tactical weapon systems. They're ones with truly strategic range and scope. Which, as you can imagine, raises some questions particularly as to what all these new army long-range weapon systems mean for the traditional relationship between the Air Force and the Army. Because blowing up targets at extremely long range is arguably part of the Air Force's traditional purview. And so it's perhaps not surprising that some in the Air Force have raised questions about Army's desire to get into the long-range strike game. For example, one USAF Lieutenant General is quoted as saying, if the Air Force can do something, long-range strike maybe, one of the services doesn't have to do it. It would also be quoted in a CRS report as saying that all of us investing in a single area in just a slightly different way, it's just not going to be affordable. Now, that's the kind of relatively diplomatic statement you might expect from someone who is still active duty and still in uniform. If you want statements with a little more bite, you usually have to find people who are retired like this one. Quote, it's ridiculous to be quite candid. It is an encroachment on roles and missions. The services need to adhere to their core competencies, and the US Army reaching out to develop weapon systems that operate at a thousand mile range truly is an encroachment. The logic here is basically that the USAF already has great ability to strike at targets at long distances, and so presumably the Army should go back to doing what it does best, as opposed to building strategic range munitions. And to be fair, there's some logic that supports that kind of position. Air-delivered fires have a range of advantages, speaking very generally. For example, jets tend to be far faster and more mobile than things like trucks. So it's easier to quickly move them around, concentrate them against specific points, etc. Air-delivered weapons also allow you to work with far larger warheads that have significantly more impact, and because you're able to borrow a lot of energy from the altitude and velocity of the aircraft launching the weapon, you can often strike heavily and hard at significant distances using a comparatively cheap weapon system. Plus, given the fact the Air Force has been in this game for a while means it has a number of relatively mature capabilities. We can do a little bit of an apples and oranges comparison here by comparing PRISM to an air-launched cruise missile like the AGM-158, a system that I imagine Ukraine will start eyeing with some ambition the moment they get their F-16s. Compared to PRISM, an AGM-158 is going to have a warhead which is significantly larger. And in its longest range version, the AGM-158D, it outranges not just the PRISM, but also the mid-range capability Tomahawks. Plus, the AGM-158 is currently being procured at a rate of about 550 per year for a cost of between 1.2 and 1.7 million US dollars per missile. PRISM, meanwhile, is budgeted to produce about 110 in fiscal year 2024 at a cost of about 2.7 million dollars per missile. Now, yes, those costs will likely come down with mass production, improvements, etc. But if you only looked at the hard factors of the weapon systems involved, you might say, hey, the US Air Force probably has a point. But the Army would probably respond with the fact that ground launch systems have advantages of their own. For one, they're relatively easy to conceal and dig in. If you're worried about an opponent potentially using their own missile arsenal to knock out all your air bases, for example, then that would pose a threat to your ability to quickly deliver air-launched munitions. But if your fires come in the form of a couple of missiles bolted to the back of a truck, well, you can just hide that in a cave or a bunker or a dugout or a camouflaged position. And that's going to be far harder to locate and knock out than something as obvious as an airbase. Plus, the systems are likely to be relatively cheap to develop and easy to deploy. 
fixed-wing aircraft can only forward deploy where there is an airbase of a high enough quality and the appropriate facilities to support and maintain those aircraft. How many facilities you need really depends on what sort of aircraft you're talking about. If it's a Saab Gripen, then it's a stretch of highway and a couple of guys with a couple of trucks full of tools. If you're talking about a B2 Spirit, then I hope you built it a climate-controlled hangar and a legion of maintenance personnel ready to carefully coax that thing back into the air. Deploying a ground-based system, by contrast, should in theory be more simple. Take the trucks with the missiles on the back and the various support vehicles, put them into aircraft or onto ships, transport them to where you need them to go, set up a proper camouflaged firing position, and you're good to go. Now, of course, it could be argued if any of these or the other benefits available outweigh those advantages that apply to air-launched cruise missiles, or to JDAMs, or to naval-launched cruise missiles. But I do sometimes worry that going too far into that kind of competitive analysis might be missing the core point. And that is that in a future near-peer conflict, the warfighters and planners probably aren't going to care too much where fires come from, just that fires are available. In terms of fires against tactical targets on the battlefield, for example, you might think of the various manoeuvre elements that are driving about trying to complete their missions as the customers in the fire support market. And when they encounter something that they need deleted, they're probably going to care a little bit less about who delivers it and more about whether or not it is accurate, responsive and effective. And a lot of targets that infantry encounter, for example, probably aren't going to need a 2,000 pound JDAM to deal with them. Mortars, artillery shells or small munitions are probably going to be good enough in most cases. So for the infantrymen on the ground, giving army access to more long-range firepower is probably going to be very welcome. If there isn't an aircraft on station, well, maybe the gunners are instead waiting by their guns, waiting to provide fire support. Maybe it's easier to have a personal relationship to train together and have a good understanding with army artillery units, as opposed to whatever air force squadrons are providing CAS. And then there's the possibilities presented by artillery using its own sensors the way it has in Ukraine to find its own targets. Artillery units with access to drones might be able to locate targets and engage them almost in real time, whereas calling in air support might take minutes or longer. You might also suggest at the tactical level that the more that army manoeuvre units can rely on calling on army howitzers or missile systems for fire support, the less strain there is going to be on air force units to be doing close air support, thus reducing the odds that those aircraft are already busy when a unit does need a 2,000 pound JDAM delivered approximately 45 seconds ago. If you are in a position where you need to call in for that kind of support, I imagine it might be very demoralizing to get the military equivalent of a message saying that your call is indeed very important to them, but all close air support pilots are currently busy and they will get to your call as soon as possible. Ideally, what will happen is all of these long-range precision fire assets will work together synergistically as part of one joint force. After all, no service is meant to be able to deter an opponent by itself. There is a reason the US chooses to deploy a nuclear triad with air-launched nuclear weapons, sea-based missiles and also land-based ICBMs. Each arm of the triad has different advantages and disadvantages. The submarine fleet is survivable, the ICBM fleet is accurate and responsive, and taken together they arguably represent the world's most formidable nuclear deterrent. A similar kind of logic might be applied to long-range precision fires. If your aircraft carriers are zoned out by anti-ship missiles, well you still have ground-based aircraft and land-based missile options. If your air bases are temporarily knocked out by runway cratering munitions, it's okay, you still have your land-based munitions. But those ground-based missiles aren't going to be able to do much if they don't have these systems in place to locate targets. And if the target is 1,500 kilometers away, that's probably not going to be a forward observer. The sensors that allow the missile to find its target, for example, might be on an Air Force F-35, at which point the connection between the sensors and the shooter become all the more important. In essence, the way you can imagine this working in its idealized form is the entire joint force operating as a giant network. And whenever a sufficiently valuable target is located by that network, the joint force allocates the right weapon to engage and destroy it, whether that be based on a Navy warship launched from an Air Force aircraft or fired from an Army missile system. And that last point about the joint force operating as a giant network helps illustrate the point that building up a long-range precision fires capability is about more than just buying a bunch of long-range missiles. It's also potentially about changing the way you organize 
network, and carry out your mission. Because if you just introduce new weapons with no change to doctrine or organization, you may not like the results. This isn't a game of COD where you can just hand every random infantryman access to a killer drone, a Spectre gunship, or a nuclear-tipped cruise missile just because they happen to hit their weekly headshot quota. Instead, what we're starting to see in Western forces that are taking on these capabilities for the first time is an effort to do some reorganization and rethinking about how they can be employed. The US Army, for example, has created what's called a multi-domain task force. This is a unit which will ultimately be based around a strategic fires battalion, which will have a battery of HIMARS, a battery of mid-range capability launchers, so Typhons, and a battery of long-range hypersonic weapons. Those will all be supported by intelligence assets, air defences, and brigade support. The idea here is that you have this unit that you can deploy, and that wherever you deploy it, it can then generate these long-range precision fires in support of whatever wider operational plan they're playing a part in. An even more extreme approach might be to do something like the US Marine Corps is doing with Force Design 2030. FD 2030 can be a bit of a touchy topic, so it probably deserves a video of its own one day. But some of the key salient points for this video are that the Marines are getting rid of a lot of their existing assets, things like all of their tanks and much of their cannon artillery, and in their place building up on a much larger stock of long-range missile weapons. This includes taking long-range anti-ship missiles like the Naval Strike Missile and putting them onto a relatively light and mobile and foreign deployable platform. An idea, it should be noted, the Americans absolutely do not have a monopoly on. And wherever you see this concept, it's often associated with the idea of giving a force more and more access to long-range precision firepower, capable of striking targets wherever the next generation of sensors and networking reveals a valuable target in need of striking. So the future, it seems, may be a battlefield where sides have access to a larger supply of accurate long-range munitions than ever before. Combined with systems like drones and new generations of sensors to enable them to find the targets for those weapons to engage. And as the fighting in Ukraine may already have hinted, that might have implications for the ways armies have to fight. And so I thought we'd close out by looking at some of the potential countermeasures to this new generation of long-range precision weapons. The first thing to say is that it becomes increasingly important to deny your opponent access to precision. As precision weapons become available in greater numbers, become even more precise, more deadly, and have ever longer ranges, then the cost for allowing your enemy to freely use them against targets that they can locate is going to get ever higher. But conversely, so too is the relative advantage of whoever is able to shut down the other guy's kill chain. If you can keep your drones in the air, your communications active, your network intact, but you're able to somehow disrupt your opponent's communication or network, then you have a titanic advantage. Because all the precision weapons in the world will not help them if they can't tell the missile systems where the targets are. Another option might be to find a technological counter to these precision capabilities. For example, if a weapon is entirely dependent on GPS guidance and you're able to find a way to fool that GPS system into thinking it's somewhere else, then even if your opponent has the best network and sensors in the world, they may just end up using those sensors to watch their PGMs remodel local terrain while missing all the targets against which they were tasked. At the same time, the value of networking communication also creates something of a catch-22. Excellent communications, networking, and sensors are probably going to allow you to get the most out of your weapon systems because you probably need good communications and data transfer to connect your shooters, your sensors, and your decision makers. But at the same time, if your headquarters are massively emitting as they communicate and network, then that may help your opponent locate your communication or command hubs. And if they can locate your communication and command hubs, you guessed it, they can task long-range munitions against you. Solving that problem is very much a matter for people in uniform as opposed to someone who focuses on defense economics. But it is an interesting phenomenon to consider. A very imperfect comparison might be to something like waving a torch around at night. Emitting and communicating will enable you to see better, but it may also enable others to see you in turn. Then, if all else fails, there's the question of how to shoot down a new generation of incoming. Because a whole bunch of assets that may have been safe by virtue of their distance from the opponent may suddenly become more vulnerable as long-range precision munitions proliferate. Whereas before it might have been enough to drag a damaged vehicle 40 kilometers behind the line for repairs, 
or to move medically evacuated personnel back 60 or 70 kilometres. If your opponent has weapons that can reliably hit out to 2, 3 or 400, then either those locations, those repair depots or those medical facilities are going to need to move, disperse or they're going to need to have better defences. There are a variety of new air defence systems being developed around the world, but some of the most interesting developments are in the area of high energy lasers, which while they still have a very long way to go for now, may have some potential to deal with this new generation of threats and fires in a more cost-effective manner than simply firing Patriot interceptors at everything. In conclusion, I think it's fair to say the war in Ukraine has only helped to reinforce a global trend of armed forces refocusing on major power competition and as a result on things like long-range precision firepower as opposed to counterinsurgency capabilities. In the context of a fully networked battlefield against a near-peer opponent, long-range firepower is simply too important to ignore. While aircraft launch munitions have major advantages as long-range fires, there is probably a logical justification for ground-based fires to be introduced into the mix. The examples we looked at today are specific to the US Army. And while the Army has had some false starts when it comes to modernising its long-range capabilities, it certainly looks like the various elements of the long-range precision fire's priority is going to fundamentally change the ability of the Army to strike targets at very significant distances. Now, obviously, those weapon systems are still going to be limited by availability, cost, and many other factors besides. But the potential capabilities of these systems are very real and probably provides an impetus for militaries around the world to give thought both as to how they would use these new systems, but also how they might defend against them. Okay, channel update to close out. Firstly, thanks to all of you who voted for this topic. I hope you ended up enjoying it as much as I enjoyed making it. I know as a topic, it doesn't really relate to Ukraine, but I feel at the moment that's for the better, given just how confused the information space there is right now. As for Ukraine, the only thing I'll say is that as far as outside observers go, I'm not convinced anyone really knows what's happening right now. At best, we're probably getting small snippets of verifiable truth matched with an awful lot of speculation and propaganda. I'm working through it as best I can, but the only advice I can give in the interim is just be careful. Probably reserve at least some judgment and think critically. Moving back to the channel itself, I've been hard-pressed lately, keeping up with research and production. But at the same time, I've received some fantastic stories about how some of these are being used in the real world to inform discussion, encourage curiosity, or even in professional contexts. That always brings me no small amount of joy, so if you do have those stories, please feel free to leave a comment or shoot me an email. I should have some more channel admin side updates to give next week, but until then, let me just extend two specific thanks. Firstly, to my returning sponsor, Ground News, and secondly, and very significantly, to all of the active duty and retired personnel who contributed to this video. Behind every one of these episodes, there's usually a pool of experts who agree to be consulted and provide contributions. I've never been in the position of having to call in fire support, so it's always helpful to talk to someone who has. And so I provide my thanks to them and the many others who make episodes like this one possible. Thank you very much to them and to all of you, and I'll see you all again next week.